Good evening. It's good to be here. Hello, Miss Terry. First up, it's good to see you there. There's my dear Miss Sherry. Good evening, dear, dear friends. I'm looking forward to our prayer time together. Yes. <coughs> and there is Miss Sue. Good evening to you, too. I get a rhyme every once in a while. Donna, God bless you. It's good to be here. And it is. It's uh, We got quite a bit going on this uh, day. Uh, I haven't heard a lot of follow-up or background, but I've certainly heard about a lot of people that we all, well, most all of us, i got a feeling, know somebody that is down in the area of the storms. So uh, I'm going to throw out the uh, opening verse for tonight, which is out of Isaiah 42, verse 16. But I'll take the hand of those who don't know the way and who can't see where they're going. I'll be a personal guide to them, directing them through unknown country. I'll be right there to show them what road to take, make sure they don't fall into a ditch. These are the things I'm going to do for them, sticking with them, and not leaving them for a moment. And uh, I'll tell you, we need that. 
verse to burn deeply within our heart and mind, bolstering our faith day in and day out. <clears throat> Last Wednesday, uh, we took on a new identity of Christ in the Old Testament, and that was the person of the kinsman redeemer. And Leviticus 25 and verse 25 gives us one of the most beautiful pictures of Christ and our relationship to him anywhere in Scripture, I think. And it comes in the form of that, that kinsman redeemer. Look at that verse. If a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor that he has to sell part of his property, then his nearest kinsman is to come and buy back what the relative sold. Hello to the Jensen's who are here. God bless. I got you on my little list I'm going to be sharing here in a little bit. All right. Uh, that word in the Hebrew kinsman redeemer is the, the word goel. And it simply means to receive or to buy back or to redeem. So God made a provision in the law of Moses for any poor people within within Israel who was forced to sell their property. Remember, their property was their inheritance. And they weren't to sell it. It was to be perpetually theirs. In fact, if they did have to sell it at the end of 50 years, it was to revert back to the family in the year of Jubilee. Uh, that's how important that inheritance was. <clears throat> they could never fully lose it. But they got so poor, it's unfortunate that, that uh, the further they slipped from God, the further they, they slipped away from these grace provisions that was given as well. Uh, but if he was so poor that he had to, was forced to sell a portion or all of his property or even himself into slavery, uh, he could be, by the grace of God, redeemed by the next closest relative who was willing, and we'll go through that all again in a bit, to buy him back, to pay the debt, to redeem him out of slavery or redeem back the property. And as we said last week, one of the most beautiful passages that show us the goel in action is that between Naomi and Ruth in the book of Ruth and Boaz. From this book, we see really clearly that role, that activity of the goel, and we see this type, this, this uh, Christ type pro portrayed beautifully in Boaz. And as we know, Naomi was the poorest person in all of Israel, but she had a kinsman by the name of Boaz, who is probably one of the richest in Israel. When uh, Elimelech, uh, Naomi's husband, died, left them stranded in the land of Moab, they lost their homestead, if you will, both of her sons died as well, leaving both of their wives widows. So we have these two Moabitess widows, and we have Naomi. Naomi is going back to Israel. She's going to go back to home. She's got property there. Uh, she can't work it. She can't maintain it. The property belonged to Elimelech. But she goes back, and Ruth goes with her. When they get back there, they're in a destitute situation. They're left to be beggars, really. Or worse... They would have had to sold themselves as uh, property or as prostitutes or whatever. So they were in bad shape. The only hope that Naomi and Ruth had was if a kinsman deemer, redeemer would step forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 1, we see that now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a great man of wealth, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech whose name was Boaz. And if you remember, you know the story, uh, there was a kin that was nearer to Naomi in, in, the, in the birthright, in the, in the lineage. That person had first right to the property, uh, and with the property would have come, of course, the widow, uh, Ruth. Well, he didn't want anything to do with that, couldn't do it. So Boaz stepped up as next in line. He was willing to do that. If Ruth's <clears throat> closer relative who was unwilling to redeem and to purchase back, then uh, Boaz had it all set up so that if he refused, he could step right in to the, uh, the picture. Now, after the mission video, we're going to be sharing prayer requests. So if you've got any up there, and I've got a whole list of them here that have come in today, uh, you know, we'll uh, get them up there. And uh, we'll look at the requirements, move into those four requirements, and then see how Christ perfectly and completely 
fulfills that picture. All right? Now, let me share with you a few prayer requests. Just out of <clears throat> the hurricane that's, that's, that's beating across Florida right now, uh, Carolyn, or Carolyn asked that the morning this morning that we pray for Ron and, and Audrey, her, her brother and sister-in-law, because they're right in the path of it, though they're in a new building that's fitted for it. It's still a category, I think it was a category four when it land. But Donna mentioned her nephew and his family who live in the Orlando area. Then Laura typed in and asked for prayer for Chris's mom, who lives up in the uh, Tampa area, I believe it is. And then, <clears throat> then we got to thinking and putting things together. Sherry's brother, Mike, and his wife, Libby, they live in that direct vicinity area, as does their son, Jake, and his wife, Kelsey, with their three kids. Then later this afternoon, talking to ta to Laura, uh, and looked online, and and uh, uh, our 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 friends Steve and Julie, their oldest son Bubba, Steve Combe, and 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 his wife Amy, they have three children, and they live there in the Kissimmee area as well. So we've got all these people bunched, and that's right where the hurricane is coming. It's going to turn north, and after it turns north, it's going to looks like it's going to go out the Atlantic and then turn back into Georgia. And though Atlanta is far enough in, they won't probably get the hurricane, but they'll get the high winds and the water and the rain effect that comes in the uh, in the outer rings of, of a hurricane. So then you've got Buddy and Julia there. So did you get all of those people down? Uh, if you want me to repeat them, hold your hand up. Ron and, and, and Audrey, Donna's nephew and his family, uh, Chris's mom, uh, Buddy and Julia, Mike and Libby, Jake and Kelsey and their three kids, Bubba and Amy and their three kids. So those are the ones I got so far. Donna just popped up and said, don't forget to pray for Betty because Betty's been sick. Uh, let's see, uh, Kara Bailey, uh, one of our youngest viewers during the dailies has an unspoken request that they put up there this morning. So remember that. Remember Jessica Sonniker. Uh, she had kind of a difficulty uh, the other day. They had her in the hospital over in Ben. Everything was fine, but of course that's kind of a tough time. Tanya, keep Tanya in your prayer. She is doing better and said that she got off one medication and she's doing better today. Sounded better. Uh, Diego and Gracie and Leilani are home from their trip to Arizona, and Leilani is very happy to be back home with her grandmother, thank you, and uh, she told us all about it on the telephone. Also, tomorrow morning, 7 o'clock, Carolyn has dental surgery, oral surgery, and uh, it's going to be kind of rough because she was on uh, uh, oh, uh, for bo bone density uh medication for a number of years and it's made the bone saw or weak so healing process could be difficult but she has surgery at seven in the morning so there's that list i told you that i had now you get those down we're going to go ahead and move to the uh, mission video which we've been we started last week to look at uh, uh, regions and areas flossobax thank you dear that's what carolyn was on that uh could create problems for this surgery. Been off it for a long time, but that doesn't make a difference. All right, but so we looked at East Asia last week. This week we're gonna look at Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is a melting pot of multiple ethnic groups, languages, cultures, and religions. Its footprint extends from the mainland countries of Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, all the way to the island nations of Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines, Indonesia, and beyond. Southeast Asian peoples are generally friendly and laid back. With a great sense of courtesy and respect for their elders, this is a family-oriented culture. It's common to see whole families riding on a motorbike together.
Buddhism dominates the mainland countries, while Islam dominates the island nations. Southeast Asia also has a mixture of Hinduism, animism, Catholicism, and ancestor worship. With over 600 unreached people groups, there are many challenges to reaching Southeast Asian peoples. Vast geography, multiple religions, limited access, politics, and diverse cultures. Though the challenges may sometimes seem overwhelming, there are numerous opportunities to lead people to Jesus. One-on-one -on -one evangelism, national pastor training, church planting training, theological education, and human needs intervention. There are still countless Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, and animists who have never heard that freedom is found in Christ. That gives us that sweeping overview of Southeast Asia. Uh, and it is very spread out. Uh, we had the privilege of having a, a mentor in our life for years that spent uh, his mission career for uh, 20 years uh, in Indonesia as the president of the seminary there in Indonesia and, and would share with us the incredible work uh, and, and, and the difficulty of the work. If you can imagine, I think there's some 500 islands that make up Indonesia alone. Uh, getting out to every one of those islands and planting churches on those islands and and uh, all the other difficulties that they had to look forward to <laughs> as they uh, uh, you know were exposed to uh, uh, the the civil wars that went on and and a Muslim government and 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 everything they were there uh, during the great Indonesian revival that happened right after a great purge where hundreds of thousands were literally overnight they were just disappeared uh, back in the 60s and early 70s so uh, you know it, it's quite an interesting place and of course you know Cambodia and Vietnam and Myanmar and, and, and all of those we're really familiar with those and uh, but yet we're not because the work is so vast and so great and the dangers are plentiful <clears throat> Excuse me, but I seem to be wanting to lose my voice tonight for some reason. So I'd like us to go ahead and go to prayer and take some time to remember these that we have uh, mentioned and, and lifted up uh, already. All right. Father, we come with gratitude that, that we can join together. And Lord, uh, have as many of us connected for this time of prayer and bringing these individuals and these needs before. There are those that have been mentioned here that are well, Lord, they're in grave danger as far as uh, the natural disaster, the storm goes there in Florida. And Lord, uh, just to, to lift those names up and know that, that you know where they are and you know how they are. Even though word may not come out to the family rapidly, we do pray for, for Ron and, and for Audrey and for Donna's nephew and his family that live in the Lando area, Lord. That's right over where the worst of the storm is going, that whole area, Kissimmee and, and all of that. And Chris's mom up in Tampa, it's it's hitting there. Uh, as we think of Mike and, and Libby and and, and 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 Jake and Kelsey and their small children, Father, along with Bubba and uh, and Amy, Lord, and their children are older, but Lord, they're there and the storm is hitting and it's... Uh, uh, Father, I just ask you to, to protect them and guard them. And then there are those people who be on the outer rings of everything, like Buddy and Julia, that they're going to get still hit with the weather and the storm. I know they're safe and they're sound. We thank you for that. But we still lift them up because just the other day in the morning, Buddy mentioned the, the hurricane and mentioned, uh, you know, that they're going to get hit with the weather. So we want to we want to pray for these people and lord i want to extend out and pray for those who in the next week or two are going to be going to florida they're going to be there in disaster relief uh helping mend and and take care of the needs of uh, the people that are there having worked disaster lord uh, many of us know what that's like so we pray for those that come to build the food tents and the and the feeding stations and and do all the things that uh, need to be done the mud outs the uh, the cleanups everything that needs to be done. And we pray, Lord, uh, we pray for these who will be working uh, 
uh, as nat natural disaster uh, relief personnel. Father, we thank you. And Lord, we do want to pray as, as uh, Donna's put up tonight for Betty as she's been sick. And Lord, they've tested her for the virus and, and other things. But Lord, we just ask you to protect her and take care of her. And thinking of that, Carolyn goes into surgery. Seven in the morning, Lord, just give her comfort, give her a night's rest. And Lord, allow her to come to that surgery successfully and heal the bones and everything successfully. Father, we, we lift Kara Bailey's uh, unspoken request. Lord, it's it's sweet and, and I think tender to me when one of our, our younger folks uh, come forward and say, uh, uh, pray for me or pray for this is issue. It's unspoken. And Lord, so I, I lift it up and I lift her up in it, Lord. Father, I pray for Tanya. Thank you that she's feeling better. Lord, keep her on the improvement, Lord. And for Jessica, thank you for protecting and, and, and taking care of her and the baby and just help them be strong. And, and uh, Lord, we just thank you for this evening. We praise you for your goodness, your grace. We thank you, Lord, that uh, beyond all measure, you love us with an undying love. Now, Lord, take us into the word tonight. And uh, let our let our very hearts rejoice in the in, in the understanding that we have a great kinsman redeemer of our own, and his name is Jesus. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, Amen. All right, well, let's jump in and and kind of move forward as we uh, as we get involved now. All right, uh, last week I shared with you that there were four. Get that back up there. That there are uh, four requirements in order for the kinsman redeemer to to you know function in that way uh, to redeem i told you that the first thing is he had to be the nearest kin uh preferably that was who it's set up for the one who would be the nearest in the bloodline in the genealogy to that person uh was designated the kinsman redeemer but he also had to be able to have the resources whereby to to redeem. He had to be free from any calamity of his own uh, or even his own need to be redeemed himself. So he had to be able to do it. But beyond being able, he had to be willing to do it. Uh, he'd had, he had to be willing to step in that gap, spend his own money, you know, uh, expend himself in some way to redeem that individual or redeem that individual's property, knowing that that property would not become his own because his pro you know, that property would ultimately revert back. Now, there there is some caveats in there, of course. When Boaz, for example, marries Ruth, then, uh, you know, since she is inheriting or that property belongs with Naomi's family, now Ruth's family, then it comes into the possession of Boaz by right of marriage. But uh, you see, there has to be a willingness on the part of that person to take on the responsibility of that wife or even sometimes the children of that wife. So, you know, that, that's a big responsibility. Not everybody was willing, as we saw in the story of Ruth, that uh, the one who really was first in line to do that was unwilling uh, and and couldn't, wouldn't do it. So uh, uh, for whatever, he was willing to do the property. If you remember the story, he's willing to do the property until he understood that Ruth went along with the property and then he was unwilling to take on that responsibility. Uh, so Bo has stepped forward. Now, the fourth condition was redemption was completed only when the redemption price was completely paid. Uh, it wasn't enough to make a promissory note. It wasn't enough to pay it off. That that redemption never happened. Now, say somebody made an installment and say, okay, I'll, I'll buy back that debt in, in 10 equal payments. Well, that'd be fine. But nothing would revert, nothing would change until all the redemption price was paid. So there you have the four requirements of the kinsman redeemer to be able to redeem. Now we know, because we've been looking at these uh, uh, images of Christ in the Old Testament, uh, we know that Christ is uh, the, uh, the completion of the picture, the symbol, the type, the shadow that we see in Ruth or we see in the law, the kinsman redeemer. So we need to understand that Jesus Christ is our Goel. He is our kinsman redeemer. Now let's take those four 
uh, requirements and uh, let you see how Christ meets those four requirements. First of all, the goel must be the nearest willing kin. Well, Jesus is my nearest kinsman through incarnation. Since I am a creation of God, then he being the son of God, it makes that, you know, and, and when he came here, made that incarnation possible that he is now our nearest, if you will, kin. In Romans 8 and verse 3, it says, For the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh, God did, our Father did, sending his own Son, our, you know, we'll get to that in a moment, his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. Down further in Romans 8, if you remember, it says that, uh, you know, we have been given the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, that Christ has been made our brother. We are heirs and joint heirs together with Christ. So you see, he becomes our nearest kinsman, the one in first line, if you will, to redeem uh, those who have been sold, if you will, into slavery. He was like us in every way, except he never experienced sin, so there was no slavery attached to him. There was no encumbrance in him that would forbid him from being the redeemer therefore hebrews 2 17 says he had be had to be made like his brethren in all things that's it familiar ter familial term that we've looked at before so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to god to make propitiation for the sins of the people now, in order to identify himself with us, he, Paul says to the church in Philippi, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being laid in the likeness of men. He was obedient to the Father even unto death. The writer of Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus is our Goel, our kinsman redeemer, by right of the fact that he is our next closest kin. He alone has the right to redeem me. And thank God he has the right to redeem all that is lost. And he has the resources and he is unencumbered in order to be able to do it. Now, the second point, if you remember, is the Goel must be able to redeem and must be free of any calamity or need of redemption himself. Well, Jesus has the power to redeem me, and there is nothing, as we've said before, that would encumber him, that would keep him from uh, the, uh, the task of redeeming me. And certainly he needed no redemption himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For we know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might be made rich. That's one of my favorite verses in, in you know, in all. You know, well, think about it. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, this abundant, overflowing grace whereby we are saved. That though he was rich, he was rich in everything. I mean, he was the king of all kings, the lord of all lords the very Son of God, God the very God, sitting upon the throne. All the earth belonged to him and the fullness thereof. He was lacking nothing. Yet, for your sake, for my sake, he divested himself of all that was his. He set it away. He put it away. Why? So that through his poverty, coming as a, a mere man in the form of man, you know, in, in every way, through his poverty, you and I might become rich. That we might attain to the riches of Christ. Wow, what a thought that is. And there was no sin <coughs> or imperfection with Jesus that would hinder him from being our Goel, our kinsman redeemer. Peter said that uh, of him that he was the lamb unblemished and spotless. And Hebrews tells us that 
as our great high priest, tempted as we are yet without sin. There is nothing in Jesus that would hinder him <coughs> from being our kinsman redeemer, our goel. He assumed our debt and he paid it for it with his life. In Hebrews chapter 1, those verses that I love so much, God, after he'd spoken long ago in our father, through our, to the fathers, in the prophets in many portions, many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sin, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. And having become much better than the angels, as he inherited a more excellent name than they. He's our goel. Remember the third. Third requirement was that, uh, go on, there you go. He must be willing to redeem. He has to have a desire to do so. Remember, Naomi's nearest relative, once he found out Ruth was part of the bargain, didn't want anything to do with it. He was unwilling. Jesus was willing to redeem me and all who will call upon him. Jesus is willing to redeem you if you have not come to him and surrendered your life to him. He is willing. In fact, he is so willing that it says to all who believe in him, you know, he gives the right to become the children of God, even to those who are called, not born of the will of men or the will of the flesh, but born of the will of God. He is willing. He is willing to call, save any who will come to him for whosoever believes in him he will save. Jesus says in, you know, uh, uh, Paul says in, in Titus, when he's writing to Titus in Titus 2.14, give himself to us, he gave himself to us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people of his own possession, <coughs> zealous for good works. Jesus says, for even the Son of Man did not come into the world to serve, but to serve to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus referring to his voluntary, sacrificial, vicarious, obedient payment to the effect, to effect the release of the slaves or captives from bondage, in particular the bondage of sin. And Jesus says in John 17, verses 17 and 18, he says, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken away my taken it away from me, but I lay it down of my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from the Father. You see, there is life in him. In him alone, in God, there is life. He is the very wellspring of life. That's why he has the authority, Jesus says, to lay his life down. But he also has the authority to pick it up again. No man could ever say that. A lunatic, maybe, but no sane man could ever say that. I may have the power to lay my life down again. I could, uh, I could, I could kill myself. I could lay my life, but I would not have the power to take my life back up again. Only Jesus. Because in him is life. Now the fourth requirement was that redemption was complete only when the price was completely paid. And I will tell you, Jesus did not do his job as the goel on the installment plan. He paid it in full. Jesus has paid the price in full and I have received my redemption. Jesus has paid the price in full, and all who will come to him in faith will have that very same redemption. At that verse that we know and love so well, first one we probably ever learned in Sunday school, 
John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he demonstrated his love this way. He gave his one and only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And he leaves that invitation open still. Jesus is the sinner's nearest kinsman. He is the sinner's goel. Jesus is still the nearest willing kinsman to all who will call upon him. And it's our responsibility to lay at the feet of our goel like Ruth did. Remember that story? She went into the into the threshing house and, and she made her bed at the foot of Boaz. You see, it is still our responsibility to lay at the feet of our goel and say, cover me, not with a blanket, but with your blood and with your grace. Cover me. Ruth is our great example as she lays at the feet of Boaz, seeking him to cover her and show her mercy. In Ruth 3 and verse 9, it says, He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. You're a goel. You see, Paul can say of his goel in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. They made a song out of it. We all know it. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What day is that? It's the day of the return of the king. I have believed, he says. That's in the perfect tense in the Greek text. Paul is saying, I have believed and my faith is firmly settled in that conviction. God is keeping guard over me. God has set a protective guard around me so that nothing can come in and destroy the treasure that he finds in me. That word convinced is also in the perfect tense. Therefore, Paul had come to a settled persuasion regarding the matter, and it was fixed in a permanent position in his heart and life. You see, you couldn't move him. There are some things of which I am absolutely sure, and that is one of them, and I shall not be moved. You see, our redemption is precious. Our salvation has been purchased at a great and personal cost because Jesus Christ gave himself, as we all know, for our sins in order to deliver us from them. And our forgiveness is based on the ransom price of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he's lavished upon us. The redemptive work of Jesus Christ delivers believers from the slavery of sin. And that means redemption is the the substitutionary death of Christ is the sacrifice for us in our goel. That's how he paid the price. It is through his blood that the ransom was paid. Only the death of Christ satisfied the, the justice of God. So we go back to ancient Israel. Go back to the time of the judges. Can't you see Naomi holding her grandson in her arms? Her neighbors say, A son is born to Naomi. They named him Obed. Obed grew up and had a child, and that child was named Jesse, son of Obed. Jesse had a whole slew of boys, but there was one in that family that was named David, son of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David, who we find in the lineage of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Following that lineage back, we would go back from Jesse to Obed, to Boaz, to Ruth. Wow. God had redeemed her. 
And yes, I said Naomi. And Naomi, because you see, when that was born, when that child was born, it was Naomi and the property and Ruth all came in together. They redeemed it all, did they not? The words of Naomi's friends are a fitting reminder of God's grace in our lives. In Ruth 4, and verse 14, it says, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer, a goel, today. And may his name become famous in all of Israel. In fact, his name has become faithful and famous in all the world. And his name is Jesus. For Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Solo, soli deo gloria. Glory to God alone. Our kinsman redeemer. The shadow of Christ. All right, as we get ready to pray, there is one more I would like to lift up this evening, and I saved the best, well, uh, best to last. I, on Friday, Buck and Janice are going to head out on their trip, and they're leaving Friday morning, and I wanted that to be fresh in your mind so that you put that right at the top uh, in bold letters in your prayer journals to pray for them. They'll be gone for a couple of weeks. Pray for their safety and that uh, God just refreshes them. They are precious. They do so much for all of us. So uh, pray for their trip. Pray for their safety. Pray that God just, just, just blesses them greatly. Father, we thank you for the moments that you give us. We thank you for your word that is precious beyond all measure. We thank you, Lord, that... Uh, that we can come together and we can pray together and we can study together and we can learn together. And that, that precious word is good, that word together. Oh, to be together, together, together. We're together in this medium, but Lord, when we get together on Sundays or another time, what a precious, precious time it is. Thank you. Now, Father, we do want to take a moment and just lift to you our brother and sister, Buck and Janice. Fathers, they get in their, their car and they head uh, on their trip. We pray, Lord, that you will keep them protected and safe. Uh, just uh, be the shield around them and guard them. Lord, bless them with rest and refreshment. And God, give them a time of laughter and joy, and just a good time. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity they have to get away. And we just pray, Lord, you'll pour blessing upon blessing upon them. And I pray for your blessing to be on each one of our folks that are gathered here. And Lord, for those that we have prayed for tonight, those that have been named and listed, may we remember to pray for them and pray for them heartily, Lord, until we hear the news that they are doing well. Be with Carolyn. Now, Lord, give her a good night's rest, a good night's sleep. Prepare her for surgery in the morning. Thank you, Father, for her. Praise your name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that is it for the evening. Listen, we're going to be back together uh, in the, the morning at 9 o'clock and picking up. We have two more days in Galatians, and we'll be wrapping up our 18th book that we have studied since we started our daily Bible studies. We've gone through 18 books of the Bible. Out of 66, we've got a ways to go. I have to figure that out and figure what percentage that is. But we're just going to keep right on going. And then next Monday, we'll start a brand new one, a three-chapter book in the Old Testament. So you figure out which one that one is. I'll tell you on Friday. Hey, God bless. I'll see you in the morning at 9.